Um, good afternoon. I am Caroline. I am the manager of tours and public programs at the Fry Art Museum. I'm really delighted to welcome you all to our program today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Duwamish and Suquamish tribes, who have since time immemorial stewarded the lands and waters of this place we now call Seattle. Please join me in offering gratitude and respect to their elders past and present, as well as future generations for their stewardship. So again, I am excited to welcome everyone to our curator talk presented in conjunction with the Fry Art Museum's latest exhibition, Human Nature, Animal Culture, Selections from the Fry Art Museum Collection. It actually opened on Saturday, this past Saturday. This exhibition focuses on portrayals of domesticated animals from the Fry Art Museum's collection as a way to examine how human animal relations have shifted over time and to reflect upon the role animals play, role art plays in mediating our relationships with animals more broadly. And as a reminder, this show is on view at the Fry through August 21st of 2022. This exhibition is guest curated by Kathleen Chapman, an associate professor of art history at Virginia Commonwealth University. Kathleen specializes in late 19th and early 20th century European art, particularly German modernism. Her publications include expressionism and poster design in Germany from 1905 to 1922 between spirit and commerce and articles focusing on art, visual culture, and collecting practices in Wilhelmine and Weimar, Germany. So please join me in welcoming Kathleen Chapman. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Caroline. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you today a bit about the exhibition. I'm very excited that it's opened. Um, I'm hardly waiting I, that before I can come and see it. Um, and yeah, I hope I hope as many as, as uh, of you as you can will get an opportunity to see it. I apologize in advance. I've got a strange technology set up here. I hope you can um, see what I'm doing, or like follow me as I talk. Caroline's going to help me with the slides today because of my technical crisis. So anyway, here we go. Um, first, a bit about how I came to this exhibition project. Um, I basically came to this project um, through my interest in, in representations of animals during the years of the German Empire, um, which were, was from 1871 till 1918. And this includes the, the colonial era of Germany as well. And I was primarily interested at the outset in depictions of supposedly exotic animals, um, big game animals, such as lions, wildebeests, elephants, giraffes, et cetera, et cetera, from the German colonies. However, when I started researching animals who specialized in animal imagery during this period, I discovered that one of the artists whose work seemed to sell most often um, was one who specialized in domesticated animals, Heinrich von Zugel. Um, and I admit that Zugel is the type of artist whose work I tended to ignore. Um, one who focused on rural scenes and farm animals. I have to admit, I had fallen for the lure of, of um, you know, exotic me megafauna that are deemed foreign and exotic um, and, you know, sort of exciting for European viewers. So I'd, I'd sort of fallen into that, you know, wow, you know, got to go for the quote unquote exotic. Um, so I had been interested primarily in wild animals whose habitats had for many years been steadily degraded and even destroyed by human activity. Um, and of course, links between um, wildlife conservation and colonialism have been pretty well researched and, and documented by now. Um, but I think there's a lot more to do in terms of visual art um, in relation to this area. Nevertheless, domesticated animals. Thank you, Heinrich von Siegel. And of course, um, the Fry collection includes very, very, um, I, I think actually in the United States, it's the largest collection of Zubel paintings in the United States. And that is what brought me to start really seriously investigating the Fry collection. Zubel's popularity widened the scope of the types of art and artworks I decided to consider since images of farm animals in European landscapes seems to seem to have been as collectible and to have circulated as widely and perhaps, you know, maybe, maybe even more so 
as images of wild animals from the colonized territories claimed by Germany and other colonized, or excuse me, European countries and the US. As I've said, Sugal was the reason I initially visited the Fry Museum. Um, the fun collection contains several paintings by him. And once I started examining the collection more closely, it became strikingly apparent the paintings of domesticated animals by a variety of artists comprise a substantial portion of, of this particular collection. And this is why I'm very honored to have this opportunity to um, sort of organize this exhibition, drawing from the resources in this collection. Another thing that really drew me to Tsugal is the fact, and, and you know, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to tell Caroline when to advance the slides. Karen, Caroline, could you um, show the, the first um, Tsugal slide with the, it's got two things of heavy labor, schwere Arbeit. So the next, yeah, the next slide. Yes, thank you. Um, so these paintings are, are what really sort of grabbed my attention from Tsu, uh, when it comes to Tsugal's paintings. These um, paintings are monumentally sized and he did a whole series of these things. Um, he, and you can see the dates on them, 1928, 1904. He worked for several years on these and they're huge. They're like nine by 10 feet. Um, and schwere Arbeit means heavy labor or hard work, um, heavy work. And what really interested me about these paintings is the fact that it really focuses on the oxen. It doesn't really pay much attention, Sugal did not pay much attention at all to the person guiding the plow. You can kind of see it in the lower painting, but you really barely see the plowman in, in, in the upper painting. Um, and that focus on the animal is what really drew my attention. Um, just parenthetically, some of the unfortunate stuff about the way that Sugal's um, paintings were understood during the Nazi era um, is that they looked at his paintings and saw uh, this is great instantiations of, you know, the blood and soil ideal. I don't really know if Sugal was all that interested in those types of nationalist ideologies. Um, as I say, I need to, you know, th this is something that I'm interested in primarily because of the focus on the animal. Um, just to let you know that, that there is that kind of like awful um, resonance that, that has gotten attached to this painting just because the Nazis were, were very excited by this painting as well. Um, so the next slide then, you know, we can freeze on the next slide. Um, the exhibition is a consideration of the depictions of animals and selected paintings from the founding collection at the Fly Art Museum, um, as well as some painting, paintings and prints from the permanent collection in relation to the means by which Charles and Emma Fly were able to afford to acquire such a, such a substantial collection of artworks. And that is the slaughter of domesticated animals and sheep and hogs and cattle and the transformation of these animals into meat and other byproducts. The stark contrast between the realities of the Fry's meat packing business and the scenes depicted in many of the paintings of idyllic scenes of harmonious coexistence between humans and domesticated animals is striking. And it has shaped my thinking about this particular exhibition. So Carolyn, if you could advance to the next slide, please, as we sort of leave a nice tugel and come back to it perhaps later. Um, and so the close relationship between the often idyllic animal subjects of many of the works that the Fry's purchased and the money that they used to buy their art is proudly on display in this particular photograph that held a prominent place in a booklet produced on the occasion of the opening of a new meat packing plant that replaced the old one, um, the Fry meat packing plant that had been destroyed when an experimental bomber being tested during World War II crashed into it, killing all those aboard the plane, several hogs on the ground and at least one firefighter who responded to the massive ensuing fire. So, and, and, you know, many of you may know this history, but for those of you who don't, this bomber was a forerunner of the plane that would drop nuclear bombs on Japan, thus linking the plane not only to, or the plant, excuse me, not only to industrial scale animal slaughter that it carried out, but also eventually to the massive casualties that resulted from the US military's interest in developing a bomber capable of dropping nuclear bombs on hostile enemies. Um, and so the next slide, please. Uh, oh, just, I'm sorry. If you uh, remember that slide, sorry about that. Thanks, Caroline. Um, if you look at this photograph, it actually, actually, or this whole layout is from um, the brochure from the, about the new plant. But in the bottom most um, photograph, you see employees of the plant photographed in front of several of the paintings in the Fry's collection, they kept them um, for many years in their offices um, at the plant. And that's what you're seeing actually in, in this particular photograph. 
So the meatpacking plant and the paintings had a very close relationship, literally, physically. Thank you. You can, you can go to the next slide, please, then. Thanks. So this is Adolphe Marais' 1890 painting, Peasant Girl with Cattle. And it's one of the many paintings in the Fry's collection that presents idealized harmony between humans and animals. The so-called peasant girl, the title, is identifiable through details such as her wooden shoes and her simple, simple unadorned garments, which include an apron carefully tied up to form useful pockets for carrying various supplies, including her knitting supplies. The girl is meant to be understood as working. She is even knitting as she walks, presumably minding the cattle as well. She's accompanied by two of these cows that she is presumably minding, one on either side of her. Her eyes are firmly focused on her knitting, um, while the cows are in fact far more attentive to their surroundings. Um, one of the cows tastes the foliage as they traverse, grazing as it walks. The other looks steadily outward, seemingly concentrating on the progress that they're all making and the direction that they're heading. Marais has, has added no evidence that the girl has commanded the, the cows to walk with her or to proceed in a particular way at any particular pace. We do not see any kind of negotiation underway as these you know, very distinct beings walk together. However, all, all three proceed easily. They have reached some sort of an understanding, each absorbed in her respective activities, each apparently comfortable with the others. This pleasant scene is well composed, skillfully painted, and on its sur surface, fairly mundane. And still, <coughs> excuse me, it deserves close attention since it may reveal something about the period when it was painted and something about the time when we, as 21st century viewers, are looking at it. It has the potential to disclose something about the relationships between human and non-human animals as understood in late 19th century France, the origin of, of Marais, and or 21st century US um, viewers, or viewers in the US and Canada for that matter. It holds potential clues for how we can understand what constitutes work now and in the past, as well as clues about how we can determine whose labor should be understood as labor and who can or cannot be understood as a worker in the first place. And going back to my interest in animal labor, you know, sort of sparked by Sugal's monumental paintings, I would argue that this is also a painting not only of the peasant girl's labor, um, the fact that she's working while, you know, minding the cows and knitting. Um, but the cows are also working. And I'll elaborate on this as we go through. Additionally, such a painting has the potential to reveal social changes that occurred in the past, or even to promote change in the present of contemporary viewers. As the scholar and contemporary artist Yvette Watt has argued, and this is a quotation, quote, images are powerful, not only reflecting the social milieu in which they're made, but also in affecting social change. Thus how artists use animals and which animals are used are serious matters with very real repercussions, both for those individual animals used by artists in ways that directly affect them, and for the broader implications for societal attitudes toward animals that artists are complicit in affecting, end quote. While I'm not convinced necessarily that images are able to really reflect the social milieu in which they originated, I found it useful that, that Watts asserts in, in, in this quotation here, including her attention to the ways that artists use animals in their imagery, as well as her emphasis on the types of animals artists choose to portray. She notes further with some dismay that despite the fact that animals feature increasingly prominently in the work of many contemporary artists, very few of them deal with domesticated animals. Because domesticated animals are not regarded as wild, and this is kind of the same trap I fell into, and they are therefore considered less natural or, or this other to humans than wildlife, Watt argues, that the quote, animals we farm and eat, end quote, have become less interesting to today's artists and have been considered to be less deserving of serious consideration particularly in light of today's widespread and growing interest in human animal relations in a time of dramatic climate change and the mass extinction of countless species worldwide. Clearly it is important for environmentally conscious, politically engaged artists to draw attention to the plights of wild animals, particularly if we witness the steady as we witness the steady destruction of their habitats and abilities to survive. However, if artists, curators and viewers ignore the animals that are more directly part of our everyday lives, 
We ignore an important path toward formulating less destructive relationships with animals and the rest of the natural world. Indeed, a centuries of, of human intervention in nature and as deeply ingrained elements of human society, domesticated animals provide a worthwhile starting point for rethinking how we relate to animals. And for the purposes of this talk and this exhibition, in fact, I'm leaving aside the issue of pets. Pets are a very, very complex issue. Um, and I'm actually much more interested in, for the purposes of the show, um, in, in farm animals, domesticated animals that are actually used for all sorts of, of labor intensive purposes. The paintings in the Fry's founding collection provides insights into how cows, sheep, horses, pigs, goats, chickens, dogs, and ducks were perceived and what types of relationships these creatures could possibly have with humans. As art historians interested in eco-critical approaches to analyzing art of the past have argued, looking at older works of art as configurations of earlier perceptions of humans' conception of nature and the ecosystems that define particular places at particular moments can help us rethink our current conceptions of animals and their place in the natural world and the human world, particularly as we grapple with the realities of climate change in a new light. Further, like many others who are interested in analyzing visual imagery to study conceptions of human-animal relations, I have gui been guided by the question that serves as the title of John Berger's now classic 1977 essay, Why Look at Animals? Why indeed? Berger's question is meant to draw attention to the detrimental effects of the Cartesian division between mind and body, and more centrally to his argument, more centrally for his argument to the destructive impacts of capitalism. For Berger, the increasing inst instrumentalization of animals under capitalist conditions has served, severed us from animals both physically and intellectually so that we encounter them most frequently as visual images. Berger argues further that the reduction of animals to visual images has denied human, and, or excuse me, modern, has denied modern humans the evocative richness of pre-capitalist relationships with animals. Accordingly, we can only look at animals without be their being able to look at us in turn. We assume that we can know animals through looking, but we have only abstracted and marginalized them to the point that any close connection with them has been broken. There is no longer the possibility that any type of exchange of looks between human and animal can exist. That look between man and animal which may have played a crucial role in the development of human society, Berger argues, and with which, in any case, all men have always been living until the start of the 19th century, has been extinguished. And that's the end of his quotation there. And then um, if you could advance to the next slide, um, please, Carolyn. Um, and this is an image that, one of the images, one of the photographic images that accompanies his, his essay. And this is presumably a, a, a photograph of either a coyote or a wolf or perhaps a wild dog um, being held in a zoo, confined to a cage, um, surrounded by its own feces, um, perhaps ill, we hope not dead. But the zoo in particular was an instance that Berger really, really found to be the sort of pinnacle of capitalist alienation from animals. Um, and given the fact that we can only look at these animals, we can never really fully understand them. And the unnatural conditions of a, of, of a zoo kept animal does not even enable them the, the type of sort of um, wherewithal to actually look at us and, and even deal with us as someone looking at them. So while the exchange of looks once was able to affirm the unbridgeable bias, according to um, Berger, that divided human and animal, even as it confirmed the power of their mutual distance, the abstracted, disempowered animal under capitalism can only be looked at by humans. For Berger, humans are now alone. They, quote, belong to a species which has at last been isolated. This historic loss is now irredeemable for the culture of capitalism, end quote. As an art historian, I found much that is useful in Berger's analysis particularly his argument that as industrialization gave rise to an increasingly machine powered world, actual animals began to disappear from people's daily lives, resulting in a world in which animals have been replaced by signs and in which most modern humans encounters with animals occur primarily um, via visual imagery. However, I do not agree with his valorization of the verbal images that determine human animal relations before the onset of capitalism over the visual imagery that in his analysis defines human-animal human relationships under capitalism. With this move, Berger resorts to relying on language as the ultimate affirmation of human specificity, rather than addressing the complexities of seeing and looking, 
vision and visuality, and the many valences and ambiguities of visual images. One of the common critiques of uh, Berger's um, essay, in fact, is the fact that he includes these photographs with his essay, including this one, or, uh, several photographs, in fact, and yet he never analyzes, he, he never overtly deals with them. Um, Berger also seems to sidestep any attempt to think through the implications of looking as an activity that can complement, reinforce, and or even undermine speaking, listening, writing, and reading. Thus, when he asks why look at animals, he ultimately seems to be throwing out the question as a declaration of the futility of, of animals. Why bother looking at them if they cannot even look back at us, he seems to be asking. And as Jonathan Burt has, has argued, Berger never even answers his own question in the course of his essay. And indeed, like many other art historians, I respond to Berger's question by attempting to provide some sort of answer, at least provisionally. What? Yes, indeed, I think we should look at animals. There are all sorts of reasons that we should look at animals. I think it is important to look at animals, whether the animals are, are so-called real living creatures or are images of am animals. I also think it's productive to think about what we see when we look at them. And Caroline, could I have the next um, slide, the, the Gorter, please? So in this painting, for example, by Arnold Gorter, Gorter called Autumn Sun, it's primarily a landscape painting. But what is really typical in the, uh, about this particular moment in time in, in landscape painting at the turn of the century um, in Northern Europe. Um, Gorter seems to be giving us an image of nature that has been managed. Um, if you look at the way that he has composed this painting, the cattle are lined up very carefully along a straight path. They are walking alongside a very straight canal. And while the foliage and the trees and you know, some of the way the ground is muddied in places and other not, others not, is, is a bit erratic. He is definitely portraying an image of nature that has been managed. And that I think is something really crucial to keep in mind as we look at various images of domesticated animals because domesticated animals indeed are also examples of managed nature. Just as you see they're neatly lined up going along a straight path, just as the canal has in fact been um, straightened as well. So more specifically, it might be useful to add some detail to Borger's question asked, why look at the Fry's late 19th and early 20th century paintings of farm animals now in the 21st century during the relatively recently named Anthropocene, the geological epoch that registers the indelible impact of human activity on the planet. I, arg I argue that by examining these images from the past, we view alternatives to the detached, derealized understandings of cows, pigs, chickens, and sheep to characterize our conceptions of the relationship between living animals and steak, bacon, eggs, wool, sweaters, leather, gelatin, silver, photographic prints, and even Advil gel caps. And then the next slide, please, Caroline, um, which shows us uh, a painting by Ludwig Knaus, drove of swine, you know, sort of painted in evening mood or an evening effect, next to a can of wild um, rose lard, which is a brand name of lard, um, that had been produced in the Fry's meatpacking um, plant. Um, rend lard is, is made by, by rendering, in other words, reducing, cooking down um, the fat, skin, bones, um, cartilage, et cetera, of, of hogs. And this is, this is where you get lard. So this juxtaposition then, you know, the, a painting that they bought, the Fry's bought, juxtaposed with wild, uh, wild rose lard, um, definitely brings together the, the, the concerns of this exhibition, the collectors the, and, and the means by which they were able to collect images of animals. In this way, looking at images of domesticated animals can actually allow us to remember what the feminist scholar and animal advocate Carol Adams refers to as the absent referent of meat and of any other animal byproduct. Product. Adams writes, quote, behind every meal of meat is an absence the death of the animal whose place the meat takes. The absent referent is that which separates the meat eater from the animal and the animal from the end product. In other words, you know, lard from the pig um, or, or, you know, the actual hog from the, the painting of, of, of the swine. Um, as as, as um, Adams continues, the function of the absent referent is, referent is to keep our meat separated from an idea 
that she or he was once an animal, to keep the moo or cluck or ba away from the meat, and to keep something from being seen as having been someone. So from somebody to something, someone to something is something that Adams takes issues with in the process of rendering um, animals and, and their, um, uh, whether artistically or, or um, industrially. In the process of seeing an image of a farm animal shown in its embodied living state, viewers might begin to learn about or be reminded of the existence of actual animals that are killed and transformed into various saleable products that bear little of resemblance to the previously living bodies. I mean, obviously the juxtaposition between what Knaus is, is uh, portraying and what is inside of this, this you know, archivally preserved lard can um, are two very different things. Um, further, artworks like this that appear in this exhibition provide a good deal of material for helping us to reevaluate how we understand the types of meaningful bonds that already exist or that can be encouraged to develop between humans and domesticated animals. Such bonds have been portrayed in situations of work and rest when both humans and animals, animals contribute to establishing and sustaining relationships that are mutually beneficial. Um, and as I will discuss you know, in a few moments, one of the ways that researchers are attempting to rethink human-animal relationships is in the analysis of labor and the labor that domesticated animals can perform work that may not be overtly visible, but that nevertheless has significant effects, both um, economically and culturally. And then the next slide, which is Heinrich von Sugel's Old Man Asleep with Sheep, thank you. So in this painting by Sugel, Old Man Asleep with Sheep, a seated man slumbers in a chair that leans against a rough wall, while a dog readies itself to lie in the patchy grass next to him. A herd of sheep is gathered in front of them, and one slightly larger than the other seems to be bleeding at the man, seeking his attention. The scene is one of mutual trust and connection. The man can sleep deeply because he knows the sheep will not stray. The dog will attend to them if they happen to. And the dog prepares to rest because it can rely on the sheep not to wander. The closeness of the sheep to one another indicates that they feel safe and not under any immediate threat that would necessitate flight. And the bleating sheep, expects that the man will respond to its efforts to get his attention. Sugal, the son of a sheep farmer, was familiar with rural life, and this background informs the interactions depicted in the scene. He had spent his childhood helping to herd and tend his father's flocks, so he understood the behaviors of sheep and dogs used for herding and other barnyard creatures, and presumably the mutual beneficial communications and relationships that could exist with and between them. However, the degree of familiarity that guided his calm depiction of those close relationships, um, such as those between man, dog, and sheep, was becoming increasingly rare at the time he created it. He painted this work in the late 19th century, when industrialization in Western Europe had widened the distance between idyllic rural scenes such as this and the new realities of modernized, urbanized life. And of course, this is precisely the shift that, that Berger is tracing as well. As more people began living in cities or towns that relied less on agricultural economies, they had fewer experiences of closely interacting with animals that weren't household pets. The introduction and spread of machinery into agricultural work and transportation meant that the constant presence of domesticated animals such as mules, oxen, horses, and even working dogs in people's daily, people's daily lives had all but vanished. Today, encounters with animals, both domesticated and wild, often occur under controlled conditions, such as visits to petting zoos and circuses, legally mandated hunting seasons, <coughs> excuse me, or occasional random meetings in the so-called natural environments of designated parks, preserves, campgrounds, and trails. As Berger argues, while animals have not entirely disappeared from our lives, most opportunities for directly interacting with them have been replaced with mediated encounters through images such as Zugel's paintings. <coughs> and as many scholars following Berger have argued, images of animals continue prol to proliferate today in art, in film, and perhaps most significantly online, even as more species vanish due to extinction. Zugel's paintings of the man with his dog and sheep is part of the shift from direct to mediated encounters with animals, and his biography follows this trajectory as well. 
He left an agrarian life surrounded by animals in the rural village of Morhart in southwestern Germany to study painting in the cities of Stuttgart and Vienna. Once he arrived in these urban environments, Sugel produced images of animals far more frequently than he reacted with them. He became one of the leading animal painters in Germany, a professor of animal painting at the prestigious Munich Academy of Fine Arts and a founding member of the Munich Secession, an influential visual artist association that broke away from the conventions of 19th century salon painting and salon style exhibitions. Sugel's work addressed a growing interest in visual art featuring animal subjects a genre that gained popularity in Europe and the United States from the mid 19th to the early 20th century among upper and middle class um, collectors, many of whom were, were city dwellers who had never lived in close proximity with the types of animals whose likenesses they purchased and displayed in their homes. Works featuring idealized rural scenes with placid livestock and green fields or tidy barnyards seemed to offer urban dwellers a connection to nature that was difficult to find in cities. Such scenes presented alternatives to the artificial environment of the city, which lacked the natural rhythms of day and night, the changing, season, changing of the seasons, the closeness to earth, wind, and sky, and the embeddedness of animals that could be found in rural settings. The fact that Charles and Emma Fry's art collection contains numerous paintings featuring animal subjects seems to align their collecting practices with those of other wealthy collectors of their time. However, the Fry's had uniquely close connections to animals Indeed, as I've already mentioned, due to their meatpacking enterprises, the very ability to assemble their art collection depended on them. Born in rural Iowa, the children of German immigrants, Charles Fry and his wife Emma moved westward during the 1880s, arriving in Seattle in 1888. Charles Fry was already experienced in the cattle industry. And in 1891, he and his business partner, Charles Brunn, established the Fry Brunn Meatpacking Company. And if you could go ahead and advance to the next slide then, please. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't add that one. Never mind, we can admire them already. It's fine. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, and they opened several meat markets in the city. They expanded their business into Alaska, taking advantage of the Klondike gold rush by setting up cattle raising operations on several Alaskan islands and opening markets and growing towns. The Seattle-based slaughterhouse and meat packing plant, however, remains central to the business. Fry had studied modern modern slaughterhouse techniques during visits to Chicago and Cincinnati. Um, and his business was soon killing and processing cattle, pigs, and sheep on an industrial scale. His operation was many in, in Seattle, making the city the largest meat processing center in the Northwest, an important exporter of processed meat products, and a major provider of steady, relatively well-paid employment. Slaughterhouses and processing plants were located in the Tidal Flats regions of Seattle, today's Soto industrial in, uh, area, away from the wealthier parts of the city, but inside city limits nonetheless. Local ordinances decreed that livestock could no longer be raised in any significant numbers in the city proper. So animals destined for slaughter arrived in Seattle by railroad and were delivered directly to the slaughterhouse district. This meant that with the exception of the many employees in the meat processing industry, most Seattle residents rarely encountered livestock as living animals. However, Despite officials' efforts to keep the ongoing killing and processing of animals separate from, the most, from most of the rapidly growing city, many residents were reminded of the relatively close proximity to the slaughterhouse um, by the often nauseating smells that wafted over the city. Such a visceral connection between the animal subjects in many of the Fry's art collection and the dead animals that enabled its acquisition reveals a close link not only between the accumulation of economic capital and cultural capital, but also between the consumption of animals and the consumption of art. In fact, the marked presence of images of livestock and other domesticated animals in a collection funded by the butchering and selling of animals as meat and various byproducts evokes in a somewhat literal way, the two meanings of the term rendering. Um, the, Nicole, the scholar Nicole Shukin, for example, teases out the nuances of these meanings to demonstrate the material and ideological centrality of animals in sustaining the operations of capitalism. And I'll, I'll quote um, from, from Shukin, quote, rendering signif signifies both the mimetic act of making a copy that is reproducing or interpreting an object in linguistic, painterly, musical, filmic, or other media, and in the industrial boiling down and recycling of animal remains, end quote. In Shukin's view, considering this double sense of the term rendering allows us to acknowledge and historicize the centrality of animals 
in what we usually think are exclusively human domains, <coughs> economies and cultures. <coughs> within the parameters, excuse me, within the parameters of a capitalist economy, artistic renderings of animals and the various products rendered from once living creatures for human consumption have equal status as commodities. Thus the full value of a painting of a cow as an aesthetic object is not determined by the accuracy of the painted depiction of the animal subject, nor by it, the emotional appeal it may have for its viewers, let alone by the animal that serves as the artist model, but instead by a fluctuating art market. And the value of the bodies of sheep, hogs, cattle, and fowl that are processed into meat, hides, gelatin, and other byproducts is likewise calculated not on the basis of their former status as individual embodied living beings, but on the basis of consumer demand for their deaths. Animals and their renderings have played a central role in creating the world in which we live today, particularly its cultural and economic dimensions. It can therefore be useful to think of animals as laborers whose efforts help to create our supposedly exclusively human societies. The human rights scholar Dinesh uh, J. Uh, Waterwell has examined the amount of time that domesticated animals are forced to devote to so-called labor and reveals that they are as thoroughly enmeshed in the workings of capitalism as human workers. These animal laborers have specific tasks to perform and are expected to perform them ceaselessly. For example, a livestock textbook from the late 20th century confidently asserts that, quote, the primary purpose of cattle is to convert roughage to meat, milk, and byproducts, end quote. The work of a cow, in other words, is to eat, digest, and assimilate nutrition solely for the purpose of producing saleable products. In this scenario, everything a cow does as it lives and breathes is part of its working day and constitutes its labor. The beef cow therefore has no time off. It works without interruption until it has converted sufficient amounts of feed into flesh, at which point it is killed and its body transformed into meat and byproducts. But as Waterwell and others have demonstrated, there are other ways of conceptualizing the beef cow's working life. For example, cattle, cattle farmers can help the animals quote unquote flourish as they work. They can ensure that the animals maintain a sense of agency that allows freedom of movement and opportunities to cultivate relationships with the so-called co-workers, their fellow creatures and the humans who tend them. Perhaps one of the most obvious um, instantiations of this type of idea of, of, of allowing animals to farm animals to flourish is, is the, the, the idea of cage-free um, chicken cultivation um, and, and egg production. Complementing the scholarship on situations in which animals are able to flourish as they work is a research and, a, and analysis undertaken by Vincent uh, Desprez and Jocelyn Pochet. In her pithily titled book, What Would Animals Say If We Asked the Right Questions? Desprez cites Pochet's conclusions based on Pochet's on-site observations of industrial dairy production processes that a cow's work only becomes visible when it is not happening in a seamless and visible manner. If the work is in fact being performed, it's invisible. However, if a cow refuses to go to the milking machine or decides not to eat at a particular time or chooses to avoid moving to a specified area, the failure of the process becomes visible. When things are going well, in other words, when the cow cooperates, the, wor the, the work of the cow is not recognized as such. She simply is an ob object moving along through a system prescribed and orchestrated by humans. It's only when she refuses to cooperate and perform assigned duties that, is her, that her lack of work is notable. The scholarship which demonstrates that animals, even in industrialized situations, cannot be understood as stupid, passive, or as completely victimized. They are living beings after all. By understanding their abilities to resist, to disrupt operations, or to actively choose to cooperate, we can understand how better to make them flourish as they work. This is not denying, however, that they are subject to human management decision-making. This is also not asserting that they have complete agency and self-definition, but it does allow us to understand them as living thinking beings and as communicative and productive contrib co contributors to the, um, the, our world and their own. Um, Desprez is also interested in the work that a cow performs when she does cooperate how that work is recognized and what that might mean for cow and farmer. Because if cow is not a human laborer, however, she's not necessarily invested in the fact that work is judged to be useful or well, well done. And instead, according to Porsche and Desprez, 
She's interested in a third type of evaluation. Um, and I'm quoting, the judgment of the bond. It is the judgment perceived by workers as having been given by the animals, here human workers as having been given by the animals, a judgment that is brought to bear on the work by the animals themselves. It's not brought to bear on the accomplished work or on the results of production itself, but rather on, by, on the means of labor. This judgment is at the very heart of the relation with the farmer. It is the reciprocal judgment through which the farmer and the animal can recognize each other. And it's there that the contrast between the situations can be drawn, between the deadly work and destruction of identities in livestock farming where everyone suffers and the places where humans and beasts share and accomplish things together. And I would argue that in fact, these 19th and 20th century paintings in, in the Fry's collection, the, the, the paintings that actually make up the bulk of the, of the exhibition, actually come to a, a, or, or harken back to a moment when um, farmer and domesticated animal did work together, not necessarily that the milk that the, the, the dairy cow would produce was something that the, 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 the cow herself could value and appreciate, but actually the fact that she and the, and the farmer work together in order for that particular type of work to be completed. Um, so both Porchet and Depré are well aware of the inequalities that define the farmer uh, cow relationships, um, particularly the ones that, that um, emerge in the context of large scale dairy production, but there's something valuable to salvage here. Um, and according to Depré, the judgment on the link or the judgment on the conditions of living together makes the difference between work that alienates and work that creates, even in situations that are radically asymmetrical between farmers and their animals. Um, and I'm just gonna cut a lot of what I wanna talk here. I, there's a lot more to be said about animals working in this way in an unalienated way. But um, uh, Caroline, if you could advance please to, to Barrio's uh, Three Cows and a Calf. Um, paintings like Barrio's Three Cows and a Calf and Subal's Old Man Asleep with Sheep capture the lively intelligence at work in both humans and animals as they interact with each other. Such images allow us to reflect upon the types of close interspecies relationships and modes of communication that are increasingly rare in a world in which industrialized meat production is the norm and the agency of, and labor of most domesticated animals, especially livestock, is ignored or taken for granted. However, given the accelerating pace of climate change and the impending extinction of countless species, we're compelled to re-examine how we actually think about and act upon the natural world and all the living beings that inhabit it. In these dire circumstances, the many paintings of animals that the Fry's collected can offer us something more complex than simple nostalgic scenes of a bygone era in which close relationships between humans and animals were possible. These artworks allow us to recognize a persistent human desire to understand and connect with animals. And they remind us of the important labor that animals have performed in the development of what we think of as exclusively human achievements, such as civilization and culture. These paintings also represent ways of relating to animals and the natural environment that move beyond domination and control toward mutually beneficial interspecies relationships. At the same time, however, the Fry's ability to purchase these paintings was based on exact, the exact type of animal exploitation that their animals deny, or excuse me, that their paintings deny, excuse me. That they're yet by endowing their collection as a free public art museum, the Fry's also ensured wittingly or unwittingly the images portraying the alternatives to profitable, exploitative relationships with animals continue to circulate. And their vivid depictions of interspecies bonds and communication, such paintings help us realize that the clearly, the seemingly clear oppositions between human and animal and culture and nature are in fact not all that distinct. And just very quickly, and I'll, then I'll, I'll stop talking, um, this becomes very apparent in, in Barrio's Three Calves, a Cows and a Calf. Because what you see here is a, a, an image, uh, it's a depiction of a working day in which humans and domesticated animals are working together. The three cows in the foreground are aware of the you know, imminent arrival of this person herding sheep toward them. Um, two of the sheep, or excuse me, uh, two, of the, two of the cows in the background are looking toward the shepherd who's herding the sheep toward them. Um, while the calf is actually looking out at us. Each one of these um, animals is clearly aware that the working day is coming to an end. 
Um, the sheep are being driven back to the stalls. The cows are, are preparing. They are aware that, you know, the humans are actually going to take them back to the stalls to be milked. All of this is, is synchronized within the rhythm of the opening and the, now the close of a working day. The fact that Barrio has included this calf who looks out at us indicates that in fact, there are instances under the, under the, the you know, sort of fantasies of capitalism as, as Berger um, argued, but there are instead, you know, we haven't lost all contact with animals. There are still occasions where we can make meaningful contact with animals. And that contact can happen within the parameters of domesticated animals and the work that they perform. And I've got a lot more to say, but I'll stop there because I wanna leave time for, for questions and answers. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen. That was a lot of really interesting information and also a really um, exciting way for folks that are familiar with our collection to um, get to know it in a new way. So I really appreciate um, what you've shared with us. So a reminder, we're going to take a few moments um, probably five to seven minutes to answer any questions that folks have. So um, we're going to use the Q&A function. Um, it should be in a bar across the bottom of your screen or maybe in an upper right hand corner if you are joining us from an iPad. Um, and you can submit questions there and we'll read a selection out loud and, and see what Kathleen has to share with us. So while I'm letting people kind of formulate their thoughts, uh, Julie did have a question. Um, what is the name of the human rights advocate that was just mentioned? And I think that was when, I don't know if that rings the bell to you when you're showing the Murray image. Was that Carol Adams, the one who talks about, you know, the way that um, a lot of images like removes this or a lot of the ways that we understand meat removes the cluck and the moo. That, that's Carol Adams. That's from her, her um, very well-known um, sort of multi-reprinted, multi-times reprinted um, book, um, uh, The Sexual Politics of Meat. Um, she's also a feminist and is very interested in the ways that um, women are exploited and the animals are, are exploited in the way that those relationships in between them. Thank you. So Julie, I hope that answers your question. All right, and we don't have any coming in immediately, so I'll give folks some time. Oh, Julie says, thank you. Let's see if there's any in the chat as well. I guess I can ask a question, Kathleen, if that's Great. okay. Um, oh, yes. I would be curious to know, um, I know you were aware of some of the, the paintings in the Fry's collection. Were you aware of their um, meat packing plant or did you know like what their work was or did that kind of come out of your research? I can't, I mean, that, that, I was not aware of that until I actually visited the Fry and, oh, this is, this is okay, this, now I'm learning something more. Um, because, uh, yeah, it's a great question because I was actually just really interested in trying to, um, go look in per at, at Sugol paintings. Cause I hadn't had a chance to go to Germany yet to, to go look at Sugol paintings in Germany. I just really wanted to be able to clap my eyes on some, um, up close. And, you know, once I, I got to the Fry, um, you know, and, and, you know, I started, you know, working with, um, Corey Gooch, the collections manager, the very helpful collections manager, um, she started telling me more about, the fries and the collection and wow that sort of made my um head explode to a certain extent and um it, it just made the, the, the collection much more interesting in all kinds of really fascinating ways so yeah i did not know that and it, it's it's a really it's also a really interesting um history of seattle that i was able to start learning as well in the centrality of meat packing in seattle and things like that so yeah it, it's been a great adventure and learning for me actually it's been really fun well, thank you for that response. Yes, it's, it's definitely a very interesting uh, connection considering um, how, how closely relate or how many paintings we actually have of animals in the collection and then that association with, with their work. Um, great, we have a question. So Eric says, I found it interesting the mention of capitalism regarding the mass use of animals for food and the use of art portraying idyllic scenes and marketing 
with disengaged representations of what the product was that was being provided, so like the lard cans. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the real tension between these sort of happy, you know, kind of utopian scenes where, you know, cows are grazing and everything is nice and green and there's no stormy weather or like even at the, the Alain Marais image of, of the girls sort of walking along, you know, doing their work, and the, the cows are grazing, they're doing their work, they're eating so they can yield milk and things like that. Um, that juxtaposition is really kind of jarring in a lot of ways. And, you know, it, it's, it's what I'm trying to do in, in, in my approach to these paintings, because ultimately I actually really enjoy looking at them. I, I do enjoy looking at images of animals. Um, I, I think it's productive to look at them because it does give us a glimpse of some kind of not necessarily recipe for like how we should all get along with animals, but it does remind us that there is some sort of fantasy, that there is a state in which we actually can all sort of come to some, kind, some sort of agreement, um, a mode of communicating with each other that is able to transcend um, linguistic barriers or, you know, species barriers and things like that. And it's very utopian. Um, it's very idealistic. But I think that by understanding that the sort of fraught nature of a painting like, you know, Knauss's um, Drove of Swine evening, you know, evening effect, um, you know, and juxtaposing that with, with a can of lard, that these two ideals basically, you know, meat byproduct, you know, the process of clean, sanitizing, modern processing, um, and this idealized vision of animals contained, growing, you know, doing their thing, um, that that juxtaposition is, is that tension, we can't look away from it. We have to acknowledge it. Um, and the ways that we are actually all caught up, both, you know, both our utopian visions and our sort of um, degrading, denaturalizing vi uh, visions, we're all caught up in, in the mechanisms of capitalism. And, you know, how can we actually step back and begin to critique where we are, essentially? That was kind of circular. I hope I answered that. Thank you. Thank That's you. very interesting. Um, and Eric just followed up by saying these paintings were made with the start of the Industrial Revolution. And some have said this was when we further separated ourselves from natural behaviors. And he said, you're terrific. Yeah, and I, I um, yeah, th thank you very much. But yeah, I agree. Absolutely. This, this is the, mo no, the moment when, you know, as you say, industrialization cut us off pretty much from the natural world. Yeah, thanks. And we have some um, comments in the chat that I'll read. Oh, and how perfect to have, have an animal join us today. <laughs> um, so David said, we were discussing the similarities of these depictions with Greek writings about women weaving and other depictions of domestic duty. In particular, the painting with the girl and the cows where she's weaving while working reminded us that the Greek writings depicted women's worth in terms of productivity and usually referenced weaving. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, I, I never would have made that connection. Thank you. That's great. And then um, Jean asks, I'm curious to what extent you consider the show a critique of how animals have been portrayed, such as was the case with unsettling femininity, which was the iteration of the fry collection that we had prior to this. So do you see it as a critique of how animals have been portrayed? I don't know if I necessarily see the exhibition as a critique of the portrayals um, because so much of what is in the show is um, fairly straightforward academic painting. I mean, it's basically trying, it's, it's trying to be neutral, although of course that never really happens. Um, I think it's interesting to, um, I mean, so I'm not necessarily critiquing, I don't think the exhibition critiques the art for what it's doing. I think what it, it is critiquing is the, the ways that it is positioned by the art market, um, the artists who thrive in that art market and the collectors then who, who acquire it. So by trying to depict, you know, sort of like the realistic quote unquote details of a particular breed of cattle, 
Um, that's a fairly, you know, well, obviously it's never going to be neutral, but in terms of, of um, how the, art, the artists were approaching this, they obviously want, they, they, they were able to find a very popular genre and they were able to, you know, make work that allowed them to survive as artists because it appealed to a lot of people. Um, maybe in fact, I am being cut. The, the exhibition is kind of a critique of these depictions. Hmm, I'll have to think about this. But um, yeah, ultimately, I think it, any, any depiction of an animal, any depiction of a human, actually, any depiction of a tree, um, is, is going to have some sort of um, perspective that is falsifying, misleading, um, according to somebody, um, you know, whether that's me or whether that's, you know, a whole, you know, um, generation of viewers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a malleable category, but I think what's really ultimately interesting in the collection um, and, and the ways that we can think about that collection in relation to where we are now in terms of climate change, in terms of um, industrial, you know, factory farming, et, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think it's, it's interesting to actually see those images, this, these idyllic images as a critique, you know, sort of looking forward of where we are now, because those relationships really cannot exist, except perhaps on some, you know, small, tiny organic farm somewhere, or in, in a place that's not as industrialized as a place like the US, perhaps. So, well, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. And we are at time, so I apologize. I'm not going to get to our last question, but um, thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you so much for uh, to Kathleen for all the information and hopefully getting everyone excited to see this piece, uh, this show in person. Um, just a reminder, the Fry is now open. Um, we're still free as always. You'll just need to reserve a time ticket on the website. So I hope that again, you can come see this show. Um, a couple questions about recordings. It will be made available um, on the Fry From Home blog, which um, my colleague will send in the chat here shortly. So you can refer back to it or share it with um, other folks as well. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this afternoon talk. Thank you, Kathleen, and have a nice rest of your day, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. Thank you.